our speaker is Dr. Eric Hobbs. He's coming from Form Factor, and he'll be giving a discussion on multi-objective um, optimization and how you reduce cost for um, when you're creating products. And Eric, he got his BA from St. Mary's and his BS from USC in mechanical engineering and his PhD um, from the University in Professor Pisano's lab. Since then, he's been moving up in the world and is now Director of Advanced Technology at Form Factor and has filed over 30 patents. Um, he, in his spare time, he likes to give lectures at UC Berkeley. He's been invited a few times uh, to give lectures and maybe this is his third or fourth lecture. And you can see some of the lectures on his website. Um, dot .com. Thanks for showing up. Um, so the title is, uh, oh my goodness, multi-objective optimization to reduce customer volume cost. But actually, the title should be how to eliminate your job, right? Um, and so I'm going to show uh, I'm going to show how you can use the parametric model of optimization to basically automate design. And if you do that, then you can go work on other cool things, which is actually really important. So let me let me tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so I designed pro cars uh, at this company called Form Factor. We, we, uh, we operate out of Livermore, California, a little worldwide company, but we make pro cards. And, and what is a pro card? Not many people know. I, I had no idea what a pro card was when I was doing my dissertation here at DC Berkeley. It's a men's product. And uh, we use these things to touch down on wafers and test, test the chips on a wafer. So who buys pro cards? Uh, Elkita, Samsung. Uh, Wafer manufacturers buy pro cards to test their wafers, right? So they go and make their wafers and their chips. Uh, comes to a probing station, put the wafer on a chuck, it moves up in Z, and all these little tiny micro springs contact all the terminals of the chip. And so then the electric signals go in, electric signals come out, uh, and the tester says, is this a good chip or a bad chip? And it comes out, they mark a good die, bad die, slice them up. Uh, package them, send, send chips out there on your cell phone, computer, whatever. Right? So this was our technology when I joined in uh, 2004, and this was our our, uh, our flagship product, which is a PH150. It's 150 millimeters on the side, and we were testing 300 millimeters weight, 300 millimeter wafers, which meant we had to touch multiple times on a wafer. When I'm touching down on one part of the wafer, and it's testing that part of the wafer, all of the chips are sitting idle. That means I have inventory, my customers have inventory, they have chips that they can't sell because they're sitting there on the wafer, right? So you test a third, and you test a third, and test another third, or test a quarter of the wafer at a time. So the first product that I invented was the Harmony uh, product. So this was the, the Harmony product, and, and this, um, you can see this, this green thing, that's a printed circuit board. It's the same green thing that's in your computer, right? And uh, this is our technology on top, right here, right here. And so, with this larger product, we were able to touch down on the wafer and test all the devices in parallel by touching down once. So it's called Harmony, we call it the Harmony product. Um, this particular product was rather expensive and difficult to uh, manufacture, but uh, it could do things that no other pro card did. We needed, uh, we needed a replacement product to test products at the lower end of the market, and so uh, we invented, uh, I invented Touch Matrix and Smart Matrix uh, with a colleague of mine. And, and so, um, these three, these three products that uh, these are now uh, were ran into high volume. They're our mainstream product now, and this one's ran down in lightning. Um, these three products that I invented, um, and so we filed a bunch of patents while we did this, which was really fun and interesting. So now it's uh, it's somewhere over 35 that we filed with the USPTO on well, that I filed uh, since joining in 2004, and. So, it's a, there's a, so anyways, we, we do cool stuff. It's an interesting company. We're a technology company. Um, and so today, I have a gift for you, right? It's, uh, it's unfortunately for you, it's not money. <laughs> and extrinsically motivated people. I think you guys are intrinsically motivated people here, right? So, uh, it's actually an idea. And the idea that I want to give you is um, that you should be working to eliminate your job. Um, 
I am working to eliminate your job. You're like, oh my goodness, Eric, please, right? I haven't, haven't got I don't have a job yet. Don't eliminate it. I don't have one, right? Um, and so uh, before I tell you why I'm trying to eliminate your job, uh, I'm also going to tell you how you can eliminate your job too. So I'll give you a recipe to eliminate your job. That's why the title should have been uh, I'm eliminating your job, maybe more people. Yeah, more people. And they would have been upset. Um, so you can use parametric design with optimization and, and selection parameters to automate, um, to automate design. And we should be doing that. And we should be doing that because, um, <coughs> because when we do that, we figure out how to do this. What we can do is we can eliminate all the mundane work that we do all the time, right? In, in industry, uh, one of the things that was just absolutely surprising to me was I went to work and what I found was there were a factory of mechanical engineers doing recursive mechanical design making decisions that were algorithmic style decisions. Decisions like computers could make faster and with better repeatability than humans could. So I thought that was kind of silly. Why, are, why am I paying exorbitant costs for humans to go do these things when they take a long time and they, they weren't repeatable? Right? It was throwing a lot of variation. And all of a sudden, I have these complex designs, uh, and they were custom, and they would have errors in them, and they would have repeat errors. It wouldn't be, it would be, it would be terrible if it wasn't a repeat. I mean, it would be better if it wasn't a repeat error. It was the first time we did it, but we would have repetitions of errors, which would lead to long lead times and upset customers. Not acceptable. So today, I'm going to give you an idea. I'm going to go more than an idea. I'm going to give you a recipe. If you follow my recipe, you can eliminate your job too. And this. This will make you differentiable when you go to get a job, by the way, right? There's a world, you guys are a commodity. I was a commodity too, right? Mechanical engineers, man, they're just, people are cranking them out. And guess what, the education system here is not as good as it is everywhere else in the world, right? So you guys understand that you have to differentiate yourself, right? And like the, the, whole, the whole era of mechanical engineers just cranking out these prints, right? It's just, it's over, dudes, right? Let's get smarter, let's do the job smarter. All right, so we're gonna have a silly project today. I came up with it, right? I can't tell you all the things that I do at my company. That's not okay. It's, that's secret. That's my trade secret. I'm not sharing it with you guys, right? But um, what I will do is I will we'll, we'll come up with this idea about something that I want, right? So we all have these cell phone interfaces, and there's all these in, in the town I live in. There's all these signs, right? Ticket in one uh, cell phone in one hand, ticket in the other, right? And I think that's what what that's telling us. All these people getting tickets for texting while they drive these things is that actually the big problem is is that the interface between technology and our and us is terrible right if I want to take a picture I got to pull something out of my pocket I got to type in my security code and I got to take a picture right um, I look at you guys I don't see your names floating above your head I have to remember it right I have to remember and think about how to contact you what your interests are it, it seems like it seems like there should be a much better interface um, and it's not like I'm the first person to have this idea right the heads up displays it's been around a long time right so my hypothesis is they must need uh, parametric mechanical design uh, to solve the problem so we can have this. Because they have MEM solutions where they have these little you know, scanning mirrors and they can put stuff on glasses, right? So I came up with this very silly concept just for this lecture for us to have a discussion on, which is glasses uh, you know, with the earpiece. And by the way, this is kind of a lame earpiece. I don't think I want this here. But uh, glasses with cameras up front. Um, basically, I want the cell phone in my glasses, right? Because I kind of think also like the infrastructure to like put these big displays or have this floating information, you know, like Iron Man, right? Think about the infrastructure that's required for that and the power required for that. Whereas if it's all in your glasses, actually the power requirements are really small, right? So it seems like this is actually a better way to spend not only uh, not only spend energy, right? But then we'll, we'll be able to, we'll be more integrated. I mean, imagine in this room we walk in the walls are blank, but they're dancing. In my eyes, they're dancing with artistic things, right? That would be dope. Well, that'd be fine, right? So this is the problem we're going to solve today. And by the way, it's not a new idea. And the problem is actually that um, the problem is actually that with this particular design is that everybody wants their own. I want mine for me. You want you for yours. And your face is different than my face. Is different than her face. Is different than her face. Different than his face. So all these things. And also, we all want different things in it, right? I want 100 gigs, right? 64 gigs is good for you, right? So, anyways, we have these different uh, we have these different needs that need to be satisfied. So, we're gonna go make custom pot, uh, a custom pot, right? So, where's another another customized product? I mean, a lot of people think that customized products um, they don't exist as much 
They don't exist that much. Well, actually, the iPhone is a custom product. Uh, and Apple knew that one of the adoption points was going to be that people want their own stuff, right? This is the era of customization. Uh, it's the custom revolution, right? I can have anything I want. I can have my information my way, and I can have it now. It's incredible, right? So what about for the rest of the stuff? What about for the mechanical stuff, right? I work in a, in a, in a custom environment where every design I get for a pro card is different. It's completely different. It's never the same. Never the same. Um, but there was a constraint. Apple knew it was a constraint, but they couldn't build all the apps that you want on the phone, right? So they opened up a, a programming interface by which other people could go make ideas. And also, by the way, like the thing that's really interesting about this custom product is I think Apple also understood that, um, that their bureaucratic structure for making the applications that are on iPhone, they wouldn't be in line with what our needs were. So that bureaucratic process of them selecting uh, the things that were on there, um, that would limit, that would also limit the advancement and adoption of the phone, right? So they put an accelerometer in there with a gyroscope, and now we have the iPhone, and it's everywhere. I like mine. Um, I can get the news when I want it. Um, you know, you start to see other strange things that are going on with customized design, right? Uh, you can't see it very well here, but there's a little New York insignia, in, uh, insignia here in a baseball, uh, a baseball-looking artifact on Oakley. So now you can actually go to Oakley, and if you go on their webpage, you can custom make your own glasses, and, and I could have one that says Doc Cobbs here, and you can have one that says your name, right? Or you can make it for your mother and put your mother's name on. I love you, mom. And then she can have some cool Oakley glasses. And you can also pick the colors of these that you want, right? And what if, what if I wanted to have like some crazy features all scribed through this? I should be able to, to make that artwork and, and provide it to that company to make it, right? So the flip does that, right? Well, the flip, I, I think this technology is going away anyway, but, um, but this phone does it, right? You can send them your artwork and you can have your artwork on your phone, right? People love, people love custom, right? You can get, uh, <laughs> you know, this is kind of silly. This is from, uh, this is from Apple Metrics. You can go get, uh, they make these genotype array uh, plates and you can have whatever you want on those. You can cut, have them custom made for your research. That's pretty cool. Um, so people love custom and you gotta ask yourself, like why do we love custom so much? Um, or why do we want custom? Well, I think we, we all have different ways of using products, right? And what you find is that a custom made product for you will operate better for you than a standard product. And so we always like to, I mean, how many of us have web pages that we customize to get the iGoogle, for example? I mean, that was around a long time ago, and I have all my information on my iGoogle page that I want to see, right? It's my interface. So people love custom because they outperform standard products. Um, so then you start to start to ask ourselves the question is, if we like custom products so much, why can't we have more custom products? I mean, why can't I have everything made for me, right? I like these shoes, for example, but I would like to design them myself, right? I have a finite uh, selection, right? And I like my shoes to be different than everybody else's shoes. And my watches too, right? I would love to put a dope uh, insignia in there, right? It would be really cool, but, but I can't. So why is it? Why can't I have a custom design? And so what I made for you guys was a simple Pareto. A simple Pareto of what it looks like. So if you go uh, through, what you, what you have to do is you have to, first you have to define a customer. The customer has to define their need, right? It's part of the design process. You have to understand the need. And then what we do is we go do some custom design for this particular need. And then we go manufacture stuff, and then we go deliver, deliver a custom product. You say, what did you need for manufacturing? That's ridiculous, Eric. Yeah, it's, it's on the low, right? But if, uh, in rapid prototyping, it's totally possible. Right? If I came up with a custom set of glasses that I wanted, I can go online right now with the geometry from SolidWorks and get a quote and have it in two days. Right? No problem, actually. Like the lenses and stuff would be there, but hope we can figure this out. It's no problem. So, and then one day, I can get anything in this world in a day. And this is what we've got to remember, right? I can have anything I want in a day. I can ship it around the world in a day. Except for when there's like crazy earthquakes and logistic systems breaks down, right? But most things I can get in a day. So if I can get this in a day, I can get this in one to two days, and I can get the definition of the customer need via the, the internet or, uh, or smartphones or any of these things, right? All of a sudden, you know, who's the bottleneck? You are. I am. I'm too. I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer. We're the bottleneck, right? And it's not good to be a bottleneck, by the way. Right? Then you get a lot of attention. <laughs> so let's give it some attention. Let's make it go away. Let's figure out how to do that. So let's look at custom design. So if we go in and look at custom design, here we go. Um, the first thing is, 
uh, the first thing you got to do is the customer says, I need this. And, and actually, um, as, a, as an engineer, you're responsible for actually taking what they say they need and mapping it into what they really want. One of my favorite, uh, question, one of my favorite quotes from Henry Ford is that if I would ask my customers what they need, they would have said a faster horse. But he didn't give them a faster horse, right? He was an engineer. He was a real engineer. You guys should really read his books. It's, this guy's incredible. Today and tomorrow, read that book. Um, he was an engineer, and he said what they need, they need a reliable form of transportation that goes quickly, right? So he, got, he gave them a car, right? He didn't, give, he didn't engineer them a faster horse, right? Gene selection or crazy things, right? He, he gave them a car. So we have to do this need-want mapping, and you can learn more about that. I spoke about it last year when I came uh, in my lecture, uh, How to Patent a Ham Sandwich. Uh, in the How to Patent a Ham Sandwich lecture, I talk about need-want mapping. So you can go and learn more there on talkbox.com. Now, then you have to generate the technical requirements. So you generate the technical requirements that that particular solution that you come up with uh, has to be. And then you go through a detailed design and release of prints. And what you'll find is that, you know, this type of behavior up front, this is, this is a more heuristic, this is a more creative, this is, this is gathering a lot of information and synthesizing and putting it together. This is things that humans are really good at doing. Really good at doing. This stuff over here, can be, can be reduced to algorithms, right? So this can be reduced to algorithms. So let's, let's, let's take a look at, uh, let's talk, take a look at how, how we're losing the battle of algorithms, right? So in 1997, uh, Kasparov uh, lost to Deep Blue. First, first off, in 1996, he played this freaking computer and won, right? And then he played it in 1997 and lost and there's a lot of contentious about this particular story, right? And chess is kind of a funny game, right? Um, it requires that you have creativity and foresight. And so the computer, what's the computer doing? Is the computer is computing everything in giga, gigaflops, right? A billion time, a billion decisions a second it's making, right? And it's using algorithms to predict how it can win 20 steps in the future, how it can be have a have a more advantageous position. Uh, over its opponent in 20, 20 things in the future. And so Kasparov had never lost a match. Had never lost a match, right? But he lost to this computer in 1997. So you can read more on Wikipedia about it. It's actually it's a pretty famous uh, chess playing game, right? IBM Deep Blue. I, it's the computer versus the man, and the computer won. And it was, game was over. Game over, man. The computer's gotcha. Um, so that was 1997. Uh, I mean, you guys were probably in high school or elementary school or maybe younger. I don't want to know, because then it dates me, right? I don't, tell you, I don't want to tell you what I was doing in 1997, uh, but I was out of high school. Um, so anyway, it's a game of, uh, you know, the machine won. So, and I know everybody speaks of Moore's Law, right? But what I want to do is I want to get, get really real with what the computer can do for you, right? And so, if you go look at instructions per second that, uh, that a computer can do, right? The, the supercomputers up here operating at 1 times 10 to the 12. What does that mean? What does that mean? How can we make this real for understanding what our computers can do for us, right? A world-class human can do five operations per second. Doing addition. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's 12 orders of magnitude. What does that mean, right? So, let's get real real. So, I, if, if it's, we're up here at, at uh, 10 to the 12, 5 times 10 to the 12 over here, right? And I, I would need one times 10 to 12 world-class humans, right? But the world population is only kind of 10 to the 9th, so I need 152 worlds to complete with, to complete with uh, the number of instructions that can be made in a second by a computer. It's kind of silly, right? It's kind of silly. And what it says is that, you know, with this, with this logarithmic advance of, of computer decision-making, that we should be thinking in our everyday lives, how can we take advantage of these things? Now, well, okay, that's great, Eric. I can't buy a supercomputer. It's too freaking expensive. Okay, fine. Who has a gaming computer in here? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. Right? Guess what that thing can do? So right here, this data point right here, this one, uh, was a cluster of gaming computers bought for $30,000, right, which was the lowest cost uh, computer cluster to be able to do uh, gigaflops, which is a billion floating point operations per second, so addition, subtraction, and even comparison between um, and by the way, it costs a, so what every every gigaflop costs a dollar eighty. So you get a billion decisions 
for $1.80, right? Now let's go back to 1997, right? Oh, 1997, that cost us, you know, 5K, right? Today it costs $1.80, which is, that's, that's a big difference. That's a big deal, right? So now that super cute computer that I was playing, Kasparov, is your desktop, right? And it makes a lot of decisions and it does it really freaking fast, really freaking fast, and not very expensive, though. Um, so just to, just to let you guys know what's happening to our engineering jobs, if we don't get smart about it, is they, they can go, and whatever, people have been saying this for a long time, but I'm, I'm telling you, you got to really consider what's going on, right? Is that it cost me $5 million to pay you to make a billion decisions. If you were doing it addition only, by the way, right? right? And this is this algorithmic type of behavior that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about inventive stuff yet. Computers can do that inventive stuff too, but they're not, they're not as well organized to do it as I think we are right now. So this algorithmic kind of crap, we should let a computer do it. It's far too expensive for humans to be doing it. And by the way, do you want to be doing it? Absolutely not, right? So the golden rule is at play here, right? If you don't want to be the person checking drawings, checking 2D drawings, automate, right? Automate that thing. We shouldn't be doing it. Or making simple calculations, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, and the human cost keeps going up, right? So. What's our solution? Our solution is don't use humans over here. Don't use humans. That's, 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 that's a nice, be nice to your friends, right? Be nice to your fellow engineers. Even if they didn't come from, even if they came from Stanford, right? <laughs> we don't want to make them do that stuff. So what we can do is we can automate this side over here. Um, and if we automate that side, well, what the heck happens? Is it that before when we had days and weeks of design time over here, if we have automated uh, designers, we can take it down to hours. Now this is really interesting, right? And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, every single pro card I design goes through some form of automation. Genetic data includes genetic algorithms, it includes um, NP, other tiles of NP programs, and it includes um, that. It's the stuff I'm gonna show you today, right? But now what's really interesting is, is you return to this classic problem, a classic problem that we have, where actually, you know, once you get the designs done on a standard product, for standard products, what does the Pareto look like? But for standard products, the Pareto looks like this. You spend time designing, and then you manufacture, and all your time is manufacturing time for a standard product, right? To make the iPhone, right? They do one-time design, and then they, they amortize that design over all of the products, and then it just becomes manufacturing these type of stuff, problems, right? So we get back, now we're back at a classical, a classical layout of what it takes to make products, but now they're custom products. They're made for you. They're the products you want that fit you and your world. Um, so let's jump into multi-objective math. I'm sure Debbie's shown you, Dr. Sinesky, sorry, I'm sorry, guys, has shown you, um, has shown you uh, for standard, uh, for single objective functions, there's just a f of x up here. And these are your equality constraints, your inequality constraints, and these are your, var your variables, right? And this is the lower limit and the upper limit on any variable constraints that you may have. It's pretty simple. Right? What you want to do is you want to minimize these things or maximize. In our case, we're going to maximize um, these objective, the, the, the solution set of objective functions here. One way to solve that problem, right? one way to solve that problem, one way to solve that problem, there's lots of very fancy things you can do, but the most elementary uh, way of solving this problem is to use an aggregate objective function. And an aggregate objective function that has, that's composed of linear, a linear combination of these things. This is as simple as it gets. I'm gonna take objective function one, multiply it by a weight. How important are you, objective function one? Oh, you're 90% you're important, or something silly, right? And uh, you're 5% important, down here you're 1% important. And you add them up, and you divide by the sum of the weights because then you normalize with respect to weights. You really wanna do that, right? You really wanna normalize. No, by the way, well, we'll talk about that in a second. So you come up with this simple notation here that your the objective function that you're trying to minimize or maximize is just really the sum of the products of these things divided by the sum of these things. Um, so everybody understands objective functions and weights. If the, these weights just give me a priority. This is what I want to optimize: uh, mass, stiffness, whatever. Right. <clears throat> so that's all good and well. I bet you could all go out and do that homework. You would do that homework or do that particular example, but then you're going to start to have questions, right? You're going to say, well, Eric, um, all my objective mass has different units than, than stiffness, so what do I do? How do I combine it, right? Uh, or you say, ah, 
But you know, Eric, I can't describe all of my objective functions algebraically because I have very complex geometry that I work with, right? And in that complex geometry, I run it through my finite element solver. And so I can't, I don't have that algebraic equation. It's not as easy as 